Welcome to Conversations with Authors, where we discuss books and ideas and explore a variety of topics ranging from science to history and everything in between. This is a collaboration between Books Over Drinks and the Five Star Books. We have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Jiva Gouwe to discuss her book Refuge and to talk about the heartbreaking stories of Syrian refugee families who rely on resentment and social welfare programs in countries like the US, Canada and Germany to escape war and build new lives away from home. The book explains the importance of investing in these families and developing human capital, while providing the proper resources for upper mobility and a better quality of life. Dr. Guwait is the Moorman Simon Assistant Professor of Sociology at Boston University. Her research examines the intersection between low-income families and the social services and immigration laws that are meant to support them, but that often fall short due to bureaucracy and social inequalities. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. And last but not least, thank you for watching and listening. Um, Dr. Kuwait, uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. It is so nice to be here, Hiram Marianne. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So let's start by giving our audience an idea of what the, what the ordeal looks like for these families who are seeking resettlement and those who are seeking asylum, despite their experiences being very, I mean, very much shaped by the policies and the welfare systems at the destination countries, these families do share similarities early in their experience. Um, so what's, what, in, on what seems to be being in a limbo while waiting to be handpicked at one of these countries of immediate refuge. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about um, what do families have to endure to make it to a destination country? Sure. So the story of becoming a refugee, of becoming a legally designated refugee, is a story that begins with the injury of war or persecution. And in that sense, people's displacements, whether it be from Syria, from Ukraine, from Eritrea, um, or even from uh, Guatemala, or countries um, in, in Central America that have also seen a huge exodus of people, or Haiti, of course, um, all kind of start in a similar way, right? We have this idea, or we have this popular representation of displaced people based on their victimhood, based on that moment of injury. But when we actually look at it, everybody shares, uh, you know, a life, right? A life that was established in a place with loved ones, with neighbors down the street, with a home that they resided in, with connections that they have, with, you know, the 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 store down the corner or, you know, uh, the, the school teacher in their in their children's school. And in the moments of displacement, whether that be due to a war that disrupts everything, whether it be individual displacement because of persecution at the hand of a gang, for instance, whether it be domestic violence, um, you know, all of these things are hugely disruptive to lives that are established. So when we talk about displacement, when we talk about that first moment, we're talking about an injury of loss, uh, of loss of all of the, that familiarity, those connections, that sense of home places where people feel that they belong, where they feel safe. So everybody in my book and all the world's displaced, which at this point is one in every 95 people is displaced from their home. So it's unfortunately a common experience. Um, all of them share this similar injury of loss um, and hurt and, and uh, a lack of a sense of belonging, which is where the story uh, in Refuge as well in the, in the book begins. Thank you, Hiba. Um, and this book covers the life of refugees who benefit from resettlement programs. Yet, this is a small number compared to the millions that remain displaced and living in places like Jordan, Lebanon, immediate refugee. What are these families' future? So when we talk about then, you know, displacement, so if we begin with the story of displacement that I've just described to you, and we look at what happens next. So for you know the majority of the world's displaced people they're really not going to even leave their country of origin so right now for instance in syria there's about 6 million people 
who are internally displaced. The acronym is IDPs, internally displaced people. Now, for those who have the resources um, and ability to leave, you know, and ability by, by ability, I mean physical ability as well, because you have to be able to move to cross borders, to pick up your stuff, to pick up your children, um, and also the, the, the financial resources to move. Um, for those that do move, they end up in countries of immediate refuge, which is as you described, countries like Jordan, um, but in, in, you know, in other places in the world, that looks like Mexico, it looks like, um, you know, Bangladesh, it looks like all these countries that are immediately proximate, um, Iran, all these countries that are immediately proximate to the country where the injury is happening. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, when you think about it in terms of a uh, sense of global inequality, and I, I, I like to put it within the global sphere, because that's how you can understand <clears throat> us, the issue of displacement, is that these countries are also in the global south. They're also countries that, you know, in the world development indicators would be called developing or low income countries, right? Um, and this is the result of, of course, colonial histories, of exploitation, of inequalities that far predate this specific moment of refuge. And so both the people who are displaced, right, are fleeing the ramifications of this history of colonialism. For instance, we know that Syria was colonized by the French. The factionalization within the country was in part part of that uh, French colonialization, right? So they're fleeing that injury, but they're also going to countries whose borders were arbitrarily drawn, whose infrastructure is 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 not uh, as strong, who are paying off IMF loans, right? Who are all have the same story of the same exact colonial and post-colonial. And for those of you listening on audio, there were definitely air quotes there, um, you know, countries. And so, you know, in, in situation. And so what we're seeing is people who are, who are, you know, who've experienced this loss going to countries that don't have the, the strength of infrastructure to really support them, but also, you know, who who um, have their own politicians who use these, you know, these newly arrived refugees um, as ways to sort of garner political support, right? To say, you know, these are interlopers, I am for, I am pro-Lebanese, you know, we have our own problems, we have our financial crisis, we can't support these folks who are coming in. And so there's a lot of this rhetoric that also gets sort of spewed about these people. So what ends up happening is that, you know, when you arrive to a country of first refuge, which is where most people go when they when they leave, you don't have a hospitable environment there. So folks are sitting here saying, OK, I've just experienced this injury. I've just had to leave my country as a result of it. And now I'm in a situation where I'm undocumented. I don't have medical care. My children don't really have access to schooling. And I'm not better off, right? I'm I I escaped the war, I escaped the the danger of war, but you know, is this what refuge looks like, right? Is this what I actually want for myself and my children? And so people end up again, those who are able and those who have the resources moving again. And some people end up moving in the form of asylum, which is what we saw people getting on boats um, across the Aegean Sea. For instance, in 2015, there were about a million people who chose that route. Um, it, or for people who, you know, um, are very lucky, for a very lucky few, they might get resettlement. And resettlement is where someone who is in this country of immediate refuge, so you have to already be outside of your country of origin, um, gets selected by uh, a government, right, by the, first by the United Nations and then by a government um, for vetting in order to travel to a destination context, right? So for instance, in my book, you have people who are vetted for travel to Canada and vetted for travel to the United States. And while the Canadian uh, vetting was truncated in the United States, vetting is a little bit longer, it was about two years, um, you know, that time period is a time period in which, again, you're living undocumented without the resources, etc. So it's a very difficult and perilous situation in these countries of immediate refuge, whether you decide to put your family's, uh, you know, life and safety at risk by taking the boat ride, which, you know, nobody would do, uh, you know, if the land was safer than, unless the, unless the water is safer than the land, um, as, as the poem goes, um, or you, you, if, if you're one of the lucky few, you get resettlement, but the vast majority of people, vast, vast majority of people, do neither, right? They stay in countries of immediate refuge. And so the global South remains the site of uh, of the humanitarian support for the vast majority of the world's refugees. 
you know, one of the things that I that, that I thought was quite heartbreaking is that um, you go, you explain that some of these families have to like sell their furniture and 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 go to these extreme lengths to to um, finance these um, these these things that can ultimately go either way. And and, and yeah. a couple of examples where uh, people literally sold everything to then be well, it, was, it wasn't rejected; it was suspended uh, or put in a limbo. Um, yeah, and this is a, such a familiar story, you know, I mean, there's also cases, I didn't see this myself, but there's also reported cases of people dying while they wait, um, you know, of people, children it, writ large in the book, um, you know, have interrupted formal education. So a couple of people were able to keep their children in school, but even then, the quality of education was so poor that when they got to the United States, they really had to work hard to compensate for that time lost. I mean, we have even a term, there's even a term in development literature called students with interrupted formal education, SIFE, as a result of what these situations of protracted displacement do to families. So waiting and time is a huge theme here. You know, I thought about writing a chapter in the book on waiting and time because, you know, the loss that comes as people wait, um, the way that their time is devalued and wasted, um, is really a, a, a huge feature of how our displacement system globally um, destroys people's lives. Um, the book is so effective at comparing almost like side by side the profound effects of this welfare systems and refugee assistance programs have in the United States, Canada, and Germany. Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about the difference and the impact in the lives of these refugees and well as well like why you have chosen these three countries in particular? Sure. Um, so, you know, Refuge tells a story of people who, uh, you know, want more, but people who were mostly middle class people. So the story begins with people having businesses in Syria, you know, some were carpenters, some were electricians, some were plumbers. Um, you know, I had a nurse in the sample. There were people who, you know, as I said before, had full sort of lives. And there were people who were successful to an extent because you know, and as I previously described, you have to have that money, you have to have that ability to get from place A to place B. So they were mostly middle class people. And so what was interesting to me is what happens when middle class people, when the same kind of skilled people, people with similar skills, end up in different countries, what, what do we see, right? What do we learn about how they're able to express themselves, how they're able to be in those countries? And, you know, my, my departure point came from this idea in the literature, you know, in immigration literature across the social sciences, but also just in the way we talk about immigrants, you know, even if you're not a social scientist, which is that we assume that how people do in a destination country is shaped by the skills and abilities that they bring with them. So this person is successful. Yeah, well, you know, he went to college in his country and so now he's here and of course he's successful, right? Or this person um, is industrious, right? Worked hard and so he came from, from his country to this country and he worked hard and now look at him so successful, right? Us immigrants, we say this all the time, right? We have this in our minds all the time. But when you actually look at it and you say, okay, you take the same person or similar people, you know, they had businesses, they had lives, et cetera, and you put them in three different countries and you actually see that their success is not so much contingent on their hard work, right? Because in all three places, people are working hard and trying really hard. It's more contingent on how they're being received. So I might come, for instance, with, you know, a college education. But if my college education isn't recognized by the destination country, right? If it isn't seen as being relevant, then what does it actually mean? Okay, so that's one of the mechanisms that I identify in the book, which is recognition, seeing people's abilities and credentials. The second thing that I look at is investment, right? So now I'm arriving to a new country, say I have the college education, say my college education is seen, say my English isn't so good, right? Does the country, is, is there a, a willingness to invest in me for six months, a year, in order for me to be able to learn the language so I can use that degree in, in, in ways that matter in that destination context, right? And so these are my two mechanisms of interest, recognition and investment. Are you seen for what you can do? And are we willing to help you 
get to where you need to be with what you can do. And really, you know, recognition and investment matters for the individual person. You know, the thing that I say sort of at the end of my academic talks is imagine, you know, to a room full of people with PhDs, right? Imagine you arrive to a new country and everything you've done with your life, nobody cares right? It's all disappeared. It all doesn't matter. It's a hugely emotionally traumatizing. Forget the finances, right? It would be hugely emotionally traumatizing to not be able to be recognized for what it is that you've done, right? And so when we think about these things, you know, I, I the, the subtitle of the book is human capital, you know, it refers to human potential, right? And the, and the theory that I advance in the book is one of human capital, how people's human capitals are structured and expressed. And human capital, we typically think of as you know, skills and abilities that have economic returns, right? It's an idea that we take from, from, from the economists uh, directly. But when, when you think about it this way, when you think about the expression, when you think about it as produced in context, it really, um, you know, and, and this is the argument that I make in the book, it really doesn't comport with this economic meaning, right? Instead, it becomes, what are you able to do? Are you able to express yourself? Are you able to be a full human being? Are you able to feel like you belong, feel like you're seen, feel like you matter? And so that's a huge part of this as well. And what I find is that, you know, in the United States, we have a system where, because our social welfare system has been completely dismantled, and this has to do with anti-Black racism, um, you know, Sibel Fox wrote an excellent book on this that I encourage everybody to read. Um, and so, you know, the, the this idea that if you need support in the United States is because you did something wrong. And that's how our entire welfare system is designed. It means that we're not giving support to people who are arriving, you know, even though we're selecting them based on their trauma and for their humanitarian need. When they arrive to the United States, they receive very little support. So here there's a lack of investment. In Germany, by contrast, there's a lot of investment. They have a very strong social welfare system. It's very robust. But there's very little recognition because in order to work within the German system, in order to be seen within the German system, you have to have a German credential. In Canada, you have kind of the middle. So, uh, so sorry, one of my respondents for Germany said it was a German system for Germans, which is sort of a synopsis there. And in the middle is the Canadian case where you do have some investment, you do have some recognition. It doesn't work perfectly, again, um, for a whole host of reasons having to do with Canada's um, own immigration history. Um, but you do have uh, you do have both. And part of that, too, is as because Canada has a very, very restricted immigration system. So as somebody said once, uh, Canada is Canada's welcome mat is surrounded by a bed of nails. Right. They have there's very little um, undocumented immigration. Visas are very limited. Um, there's a third country agreement with the United States, which allows Canada to push people back. So you have this idea of Canada being like this wonderful immigrant destination, and it can be, um, you know, for people who are let in, but most people are not. That's great. And some of the things that um, that you touched upon, I just wanted to refer to about, you, you called it in your, in your book, imperfect transferability. And it's a fact that really, these families don't just have their whole family histories erased, and they're all their family albums and everything lives mm -hmm. behind but it's also what their their identity so whenever they get there like they, if they were you, you mentioned they had a profession they were architects they were butchers they were uh, then whatever they were like they really cannot transfer that into into the u.s especially becomes more problematic for in the instance of professions like nursing or anything that has to do with healthcare because of how restricted those industries industries are um so that was, I think that was, that was um, one of the, the biggest like um, takeaways for me um, um, was how the inability to really transfer all of your skills into this, into this new country and, and, and regardless of, of what those are. Um, yeah. And you know, it's this idea of being seen too, right? And I think all immigrants kind of have this experience in the United States of feeling or in any destination country, right? Particularly when you're moving to global south, from global south to global north, is that you're not really seen for your full humanity. Um, you know, the, there's an assumption about your parents. There's an assumption about the kind of education you have. If you speak English, somebody will say, will patronize you and say, oh, your English is so good. You know, even though for me, for instance, I, I've had that said to me in a university classroom at Princeton where I was teaching, right? getting my PhD. You know, there's this idea and, and it's not just for for the for 
the displaced, you know, for refugees. And it's not even just for immigrants, it's also for people of color in general, which is this devaluation of sort of your humanity and who you are baked into the system. And so that's a part of it too, right? Is this idea that when you can't express yourself, that emotional, that sense of emotional loss um, and, and lack of belonging because you feel that you're not really seen. Yeah. And the and the other aspect that you referred to a moment ago about Canada versus the US, I thought it was interesting was that they are literally thrust into poverty into, into poverty whenever they arrive in the US. And in fact, one of the biggest things that you can that can one of the biggest challenges for this is the fact that the the benefits will stop kicking in as soon as they hit the poverty above above a dollar above the poverty line. One dollar. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that's how the American welfare system is structured, right? I mean, and this is, you know, sometimes when I give this presentation about this book, one of the things that people ask me is like, isn't this just a story of welfare? Like, is this a story of refugees or is this a story of welfare? I think it is a story of American welfare told through the lens of refugees, right? Because, or a story of welfare policies in general told through the lens of people who are displaced. Because at the end of the day, you know, these are the same systems that are structured inequality in these countries far before the first Syrian arrived to any of them right um it's the same it's just the way that we perceive the way that the government perceives poverty as whether it be as, as an individual failure as in the united states or in germany something that the state seeks to mitigate um you know and reduce and so it's a very different sort of perception and approach to what it means to be poor and how we think about the poor and the reason why the german state is so generous is because for a long, long time, they were very, very insular, right? They did have immigrants, but they just didn't imagine them as part of the German polity. And so you, so, so their welfare systems are structured for Germans, right? So the idea being that, you know, we are, we are taking care of us, whereas in the United States, because our politicians are predominantly white, and because, uh, you know, low income people uh, are disproportionately people of color, you don't have that same sense of, you know, we and us um, that you have, for instance, in a more culturally homogenous space. And in your book, you, you, I mean, you speak a lot about, and the stories that you tell are about um, more so focus on the adults, uh, on the, mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I was going to ask you, what is the difference between the, um, the experiences of young children and adults going through the social welfare system and the incorporation systems at these, in these destination countries? Yeah, so, you know, my book does not center the experiences of children, but of course, children were part of the part of the, you know, my life and part of the story. Um, and, you know, what's really interesting is that I think that people who arrive young, so, you know, when you're in a low income family, you're always going to struggle, right? Um, you know, in terms of access to you know, clothing, things that you need for school, you know, the stress level of your parents. Like I've definitely gotten phone calls from, you know, the children of, you know, of people who have arrived now that they're, you know, adults calling me to say, you know, my parents are really struggling this month. You know, I don't know how to help them. Do you know of any jobs that are opening up? Do you know of any, you know, anybody who needs help with any, you know, to try to sort of support their family? So there's definitely that, that aspect of it. But I do think that if you arrive young enough and you're able to learn the language, you do have a better prospect because these, these families are also hyper focused on education for the most part. You do have the prospect of sort of going to college and creating a better life than um, than your parents had. And this, this is the goal, you know, this is the dream, right? So parents will tell you all the time, my time is over. You know, I've sort of lived my life. My life kind of got, you know, derailed by, oh, by this war. My, my life was taken from me, but all I can hope for now is that for my children to have a better life than I do. And families really do dedicate their resources to that. However, what I have observed is if you arrive at the age of 15, 16, and you're not really able to benefit from the American educational system um, or the educational system where you arrive, this is also true of Germany because the Germans have a very regimented system for access to education. Um, so if you arrive at that age of 15, 16, which as we all remember was is already a hard and complicated age, um, it's very, very difficult to break into that system, to get the education that you need, to get the language that you need. And what I see is a lot of folks who did arrive in that age range end up kind of dropping out, um, but also taking jobs to support their families because they tend to have also, um, you know, uh, parents who are a little bit older and therefore not as not as um, able to to provide that financial support. So it does really matter when when kids arrive here and the, the results are really varied. Um, in terms of what they're actually able um, to do when here. 
there's a question about talking um, about children. Um, what happened to those like children that actually lost their parents in in the war or in the immediate refugee? So I don't have any cases of that in my um, in my book, so I can't really speak to that um, or what happens to them. You know, they don't in 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 the resettlement program. Unaccompanied minors are not really resettled. Um, you know, some of them might make it to asylum seeking countries, but again, you have to have the resources to do that. So they would probably be traveling with a family member. So I wouldn't have seen them because they would have they would probably be mostly in the countries of immediate refuge. Um, but, you know, I, I imagine that because the Syrian community is is very much, you know, one to take care of their own, I imagine that people will probably take them in, but I don't know any of the, any of the details on that. Um, in your book that I found quite interesting, one of you interviewed Sakaria, a father of two boys. He mentioned that living is a much problem. I'm um, interested mm -hmm. like, to learn a bit more, or to learn, to, to know your thoughts about it. Yeah, so Zakaria says living is a math problem because, um, you know, he was describing to me. So initially, when I began this research, I am a, I am a firmly middle class person, right? My father is a university professor. I am a, you know, I was studying for my PhD at the time. So I don't have any experience prior to this work with the Department of Social Services or with welfare policy, right? I have been, you know, um, fortunate enough to never have to apply for welfare assistance. Um, and therefore, I did not understand until I began this work how complicated um, and cruel, actually, the American welfare system is. So in, in what he was saying there, Zakaria in, in Syria was an artisan. Um, he was a tailor. And in Syria, he worked in his, you know, he worked as a tailor. He sold his goods. You know, he, he, he sold his services. He got money. He was able to buy things for his family. You know, they had a little farmland because they were lived outside of Aleppo. And they were able to just, you know, they worked and they fed themselves and it was fine, Right. What he's saying is that in the United States, despite the fact that he had a job, what he had to do was make sure he earned enough from his job on the books, right? So earned enough formally um, with checks, with, with government checks, or sorry, with, uh, with, with checks from his employer on the books in order to be able to qualify for things like the earned income tax credit, which is a tax subsidy, but works little enough to to get uh welfare right which what as higher said because if, if you get one dollar over the poverty line it formally right informal work then you um then you lose your benefits right now the the idea is that it's not that he was trying to scam the government to continue to receive benefits but that working for minimum wage in the united states which is the jobs that these men could get right we're not giving him a living wage. And so at the end of the day, he needed to find ways to supplement his income, which was low, but higher than the federal poverty line with all this government assistance that he could receive. So the earned income tax credit is for low income families, but, you know, but not poor families. So if you were, a, you know, so he would, would earn it working a full-time minimum wage job. However, welfare is for families that don't exceed the federal poverty line. He was trying to receive both. A lot of these families are trying to receive both. And so they tried to earn some money off the books, but most of their money, uh, sorry, some money on the books, but most of their money off the books. And so this is what I'm talking about with this math problem, right? It's algebra, right? It's like you, C needs to be what, you know, A plus B equals C, right? C needs to be your living, you know, what you need to live in, in the month. A is the money that you work on the books. B is the money that you work off the books. It's multiplied by these, you know, by this federal assistance. Uh, no, and you can't, one, one cannot get higher. One cannot get lower than a certain amount. And it has to somehow equal what you make, right? Now, Zakaria, what's really interesting about Zakaria, Zakaria um, is not literate. So he's not literate in Arabic. I think he might, he might have, you know, some issue with, uh, you know, a learning disability. Sometimes things flip for him and, you know, never un undiagnosed, right? There weren't these kinds of services in Syria to help him do that. So you, it's not, he wasn't literate in Arabic. Um, you know, he spoke English pretty, you know, ended up speaking English pretty well, but still, you know, the reading and writing was hard for him, but he, he did all this in his head, right? He did all this math. And he had to do it. It was survival math. And so this is what I mean when I say, um, you know, 
uh, in living in America, or when he said living in America is a math problem. And unfortunately, for an outsider looking in, for another middle class guy who was also in the book in that in that chapter, you know, looking at Zakaria doing his math problem, all he's seeing is that Zakaria does not want to work full time uh, on the books, right? Zakaria does not want to work full time for this employer and receive a check for full time work, and he's judging him because he's saying oh, he just doesn't want to work. These people just want to scam the government, which is a common also refrain we hear from a lot of middle-class immigrants looking at immigrants that are poorer than them, right? That they're trying to scam the system. They're making everybody look bad. But actually, when you see it from the perspective of Zakaria, you recognize that he has to do this. Very complicated mathematics. And he wishes he didn't have to do this because it's it's actually too complicated and a very stressful way to live. But this is the, the condition at which the American system sort of puts him. And you see it also with other low-income people having to do the same math problem, having to juggle in order to be able to make ends meet and to survive, um, uh, you know, for how to have their families survive. What a terrible situation. So um, let's switch from, um, let's switch to the, um, to discuss the screening process, which is, I mean, it's another whole topic. Uh, your book, explains the political positions on refugee the let me say the conservative positions on refugee programs and even mentions the impact that these families suffered uh by for example the muslim man um that um an executive order by then president trump um these positions also are also echoed in other nations histories um such as in canada's um former prime minister uh, stephen harper who limited the refugee acceptance numbers quoting national security concerns Yet mm -hmm. the vetting process these families are sub are subjected to seem to be quite thorough, if not extreme. So, what are the what what are the facts behind these concerns of, um, in present in, in political rhetoric? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the way that refugees are vetted, um, so this, of course, is for resettlement and not for asylum, because in asylum, people just show up, right? Um, and in Germany, there hasn't been an issue. So, you know, when you talk about fears of terrorism, you have right now, Syrians comprise about 1% of the German population. And, you know, things are fine. There was the conversation about the Cologne, the um, the sexual assault that happened in New Year's Eve several years back, but we don't actually have proof that any Syrians were involved, right? It's unclear who was actually involved in that in that situation. So what you have is, you know, this fear, this, this you know, um, all this language of these people being dangerous without any kind of substantiation. And the thing is, is that it's always racist when we describe people from a specific region of the world or from a specific background as being more dangerous or imagining them as being more dangerous than we are. And the evidence for this comes with why we have this vetting program in the first place, right? So we don't get this vetting program. We don't get this intense vetting of refugees until the 1950s in the United States. And the reason that it's introduced is because of anti-Semitism that was tied also to um, the Bolshevik scare, right? To to the Red Scare, to the fear of um, of communism in the United States at the same time, right? McCarthyism. And so what you get is the sense that you know Jews are coming in order to disrupt American society, um, that they have different morals and values than American society. So it's this hyper hyper anti-Semitic language that's being used in this time and therefore this security and this intense vetting is introduced in the 1950s and Edward Corsi who at the time was sort of head of this resettlement you know um apparatus which wasn't you know formalized in the way that it is now you know just looks at it and says this is insane right and he's quoted as saying this is crazy like this is completely unnecessary it's cruel like why are you doing this to people um but that stuff and it's stuck so much that now even proponents of refugee resettlement will say, oh, look, it's such a thorough vetting process. It's so great. Look at how much we vet people. But underlying that sentiment, right, underlying that statement is the notion, the implicit assumption that these people require that much vetting, right? Even at the outset, as I said, you know, in Germany, nothing happened. You know, even the case of Cologne, even if, they, even if it was Syrians involved, imagine it was Syrians involved, which we don't have any proof of, but imagine it was right? Does that preclude or does that say that Syrians are more dangerous than other people, right? Are white Germans not guilty of sexual assault? Is is this not, you know, why is it that we always are trying to find these examples and saying, you know, oh, 
refugees have never committed a terrorist attack. But if one refugee did commit a terrorist attack, does that mean that we dismantle the whole program? Does that mean that Zakaria too is responsible for this person he's never met and doesn't know and doesn't share anything with, right? So we have this idea of who we group as being responsible, right, as categorically responsible for each other's actions and who we say is not, you know, so talk about it. When we talk about what this security, securitization of refugees is, this, this language of danger, this language of the imperative of vetting, this extreme vetting, um, which, by the way, far predates Trump, right? So this is, we're talking since the 1950s, and it continues to exist today, despite the fact that the resettlement program has been dismantled, which I do want to talk about in just a second, you know, what we're what we're doing is we're basically um, rationalizing racism. We're assuming that people who are displaced are more likely to be dangerous than you or me, which I just don't see any substantiation for. I mean, if anything, these people are fleeing violence, right? Which is how we got here in the first place. Had they wanted to be violent, Syria would be a better place to do that. You even you even say that in certain um, I mean certain politicians like to draw lines between refugees and crime rates. Yet the reality seems to be that the refugees themselves often tend to be the victim of abuse and crime in these destination countries, and these crimes tend to go underreported. And does this happen because of their distrust towards like authority, or are there any underlining uh, reasons why that this may happen? I think that you go in your book and you explain a couple of instances where they have been suffer these abuse and 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 um and and have been victims of, of racism and, and social stigmas yeah i mean you know it's very complicated because right now i'm actually working on a different project on uh trafficking survivors and uh the survivors of trafficking you know, are people who are brought into this country and forced to work in conditions, so it's sex and labor trafficking, but forced to work in conditions, whether it be sex or labor trafficking, um, that are arduous, that are illegal, and without pay, and without recognition, and sometimes under situations of severe abuse, and very, very few of them go to law enforcement, and the reason for that is that people are fearful of access to law enforcement. They don't feel like it's accessible to them. And also they're predominantly people of color who law enforcement is not particularly, um, you know, kind to, um, and not particularly known to recognize um, and to treat appropriately. And so what we have is a situation where, you know, law enforcement does not, you know, for a woman with a hijab or for, for you know, for a man whose name is Muhammad, American law enforcement isn't where you go when you feel fearful, right? Um, and actually, in this community, law enforcement behaved very poorly. So there was one guy who, um, as a result of, and this is in a footnote, sort of in the back of the book, I didn't really know where to put it, but one guy who um, had mental health issues, um, he really suffered from sort of uh, delusions for a while. He he it, they, it turned into seizures um, because he wasn't sleeping at night because you know anxiety both about his family in the United States, but also he kept thinking about his mother who did not have access to heating oil in Syria. So he couldn't sleep at night because he kept thinking about how cold his mother was, um, which is just like a heartbreaking, um, you know, fact of how the interconnectedness that people feel around the war. Um, but. He um he he began to get mental health treatment. He was hospitalized first and then began to get mental health treatment. And, you know, after months of mental health treatment, there was a day when he decided his wife said, you know what, you know, we've been kind of in this mood for a while. Let's invite all of our friends over and have sort of a little party for ourselves. We can grill outside. Um, and the community came over and that day he had a mental health appointment. He called in the morning and said he wasn't going to be able to make it. Somehow that call ended up on an answering machine. Nobody heard it. And therefore, when he didn't show up to his mental health appointment because he was classified as a suicide risk, it triggered a mental health um, check, right? So typically your mental health check means that your therapist calls you in the house um, or that somebody from the therapist's office comes to your home. But apparently because he was part of the state mental health, nobody from the mental health office uh, was able to come that day. His therapist wasn't able to come and therefore it got escalated to the police. So the police showed up with two cop cars, sirens going, high beams on, dogs. They enter the home with the dogs. People, the 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 men in the house or the, the men and women in the house could not um, speak to them quickly enough in, in English. The So the, the police entered the home with the dogs um, and began to search for the man. Um, the wife, fearful, 
picked up her children and ran out of the back uh, stairs, you know, triggered also by the trauma of, you know, military men and people being at her door, which happened to her in Syria. She had actually two brothers who were killed in the war, picked up her children and ran out of the fire escape, which resulted in the police chasing her down the fire escape and grabbing her. And as a result of this, completely unnecessary show of force, right? Completely unnecessary re-traumatizing of somebody who has been traumatized and traumatized and traumatized. Do you think that that community is ever going to talk to the police again? And so what we have is these constant injuries, right? And this is why it's so important to bring race and the story of racism, the American story of race and racism into this, which is that, you know, the Syrians are arriving and are being slated into an American racial structure. And people who are, who have been previously, um, you know, who are, who are minoritized, right? Who are deemed to be non-white, who are, you know, racialized as being dangerous, et cetera, as the Trump rhetoric clearly showed, but this of course preceded the Trump rhetoric, are not going to find respite in the American enforcement system, right? So that's why you have these hate crimes, which you don't really have. Um, a lot of access to to police because it it's not a safe space. Terrible. I agree. Of course, they will never reach the police again if they if they face any issue. If it is like that harm, like that bad, they will never do it. No. Why? I mean, would you? No, I wouldn't. No. And speaking about mental health, we had one question about it. Um, mm -hmm. One aspect that get often. Um, overlooked in the book is that when it comes with refugees, it's mental health and post-traumatic stress as a result of the war and the dark conditions at this time. How prevalent is this in the refugee community, especially in children? Um, I believe around 42% of Syrian refugees are younger than 18. And yeah. are there any programs uh, and resources that often, like treat the mental health assistance? Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. So, you know, there's a couple of children in the study that did exhibit um, pretty severe, like separation anxiety, um, but also like not being able to sleep at night, wetting the bed, right? All things that we know are um, manifestations of this. Um, and the problem is that, you know, you can get mental health support, um, but mental health support isn't developed to the extent as part of our actual healthcare system that allows it to be actually robust and responsive to the needs, for instance, of children in this situation. So one issue, this is a very logistical issue, right? That is seems to be easily mitigated, but just was not, um, is translation. So you have a ch child. So it, Arabic has a lot of dialects. So I'm Egyptian. I could speak to Syrians. Um, me and Syrian adults can speak fine. Sometimes there's words, they'll say something, I'll be like, I didn't understand you. They'll describe it to me. I'll be able to understand. So it's kind of like Spanish, right? Different countries have different dialects, but kind of like with Spanish, if you are an adult, say you're a Chilean adult and you're speaking to a Cuban child, they don't have the language capital to be able to fully understand all of the words that you say because of the accent, but also because you might be using different kinds of, you know, phrases. So us adults, we can manage it. It. But for children, it's very complicated. Also, if you change the interpreters every time, a child who is already anxious about doing this or uncomfortable is not going to be willing to participate, you know, with all these different, you're going to have to break the ice or even an adult, right? You're going to have to break the ice with a new person every time, even if the therapist is the same. And so, you know, the, this issue of the consistency of interpretation and also getting the dialect exactly right um, was a huge concern. So for a while, I was trying to help my, my friend's daughter um, needed this therapy because, you know, one of the people in the book's daughter needed this therapy. Um, and so for a while, I was trying to help interpret, you know, the therapy sessions. Interpreting therapy sessions is hugely emotionally taxing, but also because I have the Egyptian dialect, it was too far for the for the child, you know, even in the, though in my mind, I was trying to speak in Syrian. I don't, I didn't grow up there. So I didn't know all the, I, I don't know all the turns of phrase. So it was very hard for this child, but it, it you know, it was just a question of, of consistency and actually having the support and, you know, across country, is people really uh, complained that the mental health care just was not robust enough, neither to adult nor children's needs. Um, referring to human capital in your book, uh, you mentioned that 
and 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 I quote you you mentioned that uh, it is less the value of a person and more how the person is valued. Um, mm -hmm. The production of human capital is constrained by the inequalities such as race, gender, and and class at the mm -hmm. countries, um, which limit both their ability to acquire new skills uh, or credentials and the ability to actually apply them into a labor market. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is mainly the responsibility of the government in offering those um the, the access to those um to those um to those resources but the other one is a result of the social stigmas and discriminations ingrained in our society so how do you mitigate the latter or how i mean i know it's a probably like a tough a tough broad question but how how do we mitigate something that is so ingrained in our society as the social stigmas and 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 racial divides yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how to solve racism. I I wouldn't be, I think I wouldn't be here. Um, you know, I'd be doing something else. You know, I'd be like, you know, solving it if I knew. But um, but I do think that I do think that giving people access to resources, I think that allowing people the chance to be who they are fully, right? So I think that the way that I answer that is to sort of flip the flip the script, to say we're not focused at a societal level, we're not focused on white people's perceptions of people of color, but instead the resources that people of color themselves have in order to be able to make a better life for themselves, because that's the only thing that we can actually advocate for, right? We can't actually change hearts and minds, but you know, advocating for higher amounts of assistance, better recognition systems, um, you know, uh, systems that are much more humane, that recognize the full abilities of people is, is the pathway, I think, not necessarily to changing hearts and minds, you know, that's, that's something else, but to, um, you know, making it so that their lives are more comfortable and more fulfilled, which is my interest, right? Um, and so I, and I, and I really think that as we talk about this, something that, you know, that, that, I do emphasize is that this benefits everybody. If you truly believe that people are um, human beings that have the potential to, to be as great as anybody else, right? That have, you know, the ability to do what you and I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, then what, what we're losing by not allowing them to do that is a loss not only to them, but to all of us, right? Because it's a societal loss. Like imagine, and this idea came to me when I was um, teaching at a prison in when I was a grad student, Rahway State Penitentiary, um, which is outside of Princeton. And, you know, I was teaching these men, some of whom are there, you know, on more violent charges, some of whom are there on drug charges, but, you know, they've been there for decades, right? They've been there for years and years and years and years. And they were, you know, just as responsive, just as smart as my students in my Princeton classroom. And I wonder, you know, what if instead of them, you know, instead of the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of resources that they had coming up, what if they? What if their lives were different, right? What if they um, actually lived in neighborhoods that were that were well serviced? What if they went to schools that were well funded? What if they had other opportunities for their lives than the opportunities that they went down? Imagine not only what their lives would be like, but what all of our lives would be like. How how much, um, you know, human ability, how much potential, how much knowledge, how much creativity is lost when we deem certain parts of our society as being sort of, you know, uh, deletable, right? As being uh, erasable, as being not important, as being not worthy of our investment and support. And so when we think about this, we really have to sort of expand our, our understanding of what it means to be a part of a society and what it means when we just, you know, decide that some part of it is expendable, um, how, how, that, how that loss is not just a loss for that person, but a loss for us all. Absolutely. And Eva, well, we wanted to give you this space and ask you these questions. Like, is there any particular story you would like to highlight for our audience that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of of a good one because you you guys did give me warning that you were going to ask me this question um, at the beginning. You know, I think that the story that I mean. Mm, because I could do a positive one or I could do one that kind of clarifies the case. So I'll do I'll do one that clarifies the case that's also positive. So um, Zafir, who is in chapter three of the book, um, you know, I describe his experience of, uh, you know, his early experience here of getting fired from a job. And, you know, he gets fired from his job because, you know, he's it's it's raining. He doesn't have a 
he doesn't have a car. It's actually snowing. He doesn't have a car. The train is canceled. He can't get to work. And the guy takes this as an opportunity to sort of fire him from his job. And he says, well, you know, you've missed a lot of work before, but the reason he missed work is because his daughter had to have surgery. And because his father-in-law um, who lived in Jordan died of a heart attack after his house was destroyed in Syria, after watching footage of his home being destroyed in Syria. So this guy, you know, after having lost his job, tries to get back on American welfare, he's denied the opportunity to get on welfare. Um, and so uh, he he has to find work immediately. And while the first job was in a butcher shop, which is what he used to do in Syria, the, you know, the only jobs available to him are kind of, you know, shitty jobs. And the one he finds is to drive delivery for this Turkish guy who owns a pizza stop, a shop. The only issue is Zafar doesn't know how to drive. So in the story, the story in the book is him sort of learning from his best friend, Emjad, who was actually his friend from Syria, how to drive by just watching Emjad's feet and literally driving off the lot when he, where he buys his car into traffic um, with his phone on, uh, you know, avoiding highways, right? His Google Maps set to avoiding highways. But, you know, that's a story that I have in that section of the book. And it's a story of sort of figuring out, of, but of also of resilience, right? Of how people sort of, find creative solutions, um, not great solutions, but creative ones to, you know, this American system that is really damaging. But I want to tell you a second story about Zafar too, which is a story that doesn't appear in the book. Um, and it's about how, so his daughter um, is deaf and she um, was put when she, when they first arrived to the United States, she was put in a classroom, in a mainstream classroom and um, not given even any English as a second language support, just put in, you know, a regular classroom. Um, and he, uh, and this happened, this lasted for two months. And so one day I get a call from him and he says, you know, on Friday, I have a meeting with um, her school, with people from her school. Can you come with me to interpret for me? I said, sure. Um, he describes to me on the drive there what's happening, that they put her in this mainstream classroom, that he's trying to advocate for her to be moved. And in my mind, you know, being the middle class, you know, uh, a student in an Ivy League university that I am, I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting angrier and angrier as he's telling me the story. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that they move this girl out of this class. Right. So I'm taking it upon myself to do this, you know, to make sure that, that, uh, that she gets removed, but we get there and I don't say a single word other than interpret for this man, because he is so methodical and so precise and so um, controlled with his anger that all I do is just sit and interpret. I have to say, I do not say a single word. He made sure, we walked out of there. His daughter was not only moved to a different school, she was actually, he had the, the, the school board pay for her to go to a school for the deaf in Connecticut that you know, that, that is very exclusive and he had a full scholarship for her and there was a bus coming to get her from the house and, and deliver her at night, right? He was fully, fully capable of advocating completely. All he needed was the language. And I was watching him just in, in total awe, right? I didn't even know that this could, this could be the outcome of this event. I was just watching him in total awe. And I think it reflects, right? I think this story tells of, you know, what the actual potential, what the actual possibilities, capabilities are of people if they're given the chance. Right. Um, and so this man, you know, who who is so capable, so, you know, like a lawyer with his advocacy for his daughter, right, is also driving, um, you know, a car trying to avoid the highways to deliver pizzas on a day to day basis. Right. And there's nothing wrong with delivering pizzas. There's nothing wrong with that work. You know, he was paid poorly for it, which is wrong. Right. He was he had to work it off the books, which is wrong. He had to work it in order to get welfare, which is wrong. But but. Also, you have to reflect on, you know, what else could this man be doing with his time, right? In addition or, or different from this. And so, you know, as we think about this, as we think about these, these people, as we think about these, um, you know, realities, we have to ask ourselves sort of what, again, is lost. Um, and I think his story, uh, you know, exemplifies that. Thank you, Hiba, for sharing the story. I know there are so many fascinating stories that needs to be told because they, we are, you are given the chance to tell them, to give them a word, a space here. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for reading it. <laughs> and the book is called Refuge and it's written by Dr. Hiba Hugwai. 
it was a pleasure speaking with you today and thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you back thank you thank you so much for having me everybody and thank you for listening um you know feel free to reach out if this book uh speaks to you in any way thank you all so much thank you thank you Thank you.